an increasing global population, booming e-commerce, climate change, and congested megacities. Sustainability has become a prerequisite for doing business. Imagine what the world will look like 10 years from now. We want to offer solutions that are 100% safe, 100% fossil free, and 100% more productive than today. Because that will allow us to meet a growing need for transport while staying within the boundaries of what our planet can sustain. Nobody knows exactly what the future will look like, but we're eager to make it a great one. A warm welcome to you all to this event. In the Volvo Group, we are convinced that we need more mobility. We need more transport going forward. But of course, that mobility, that transport must be within the boundaries of what the planet can cope with. It must be much more sustainable than today. For us in the Volvo Group, uh, we have set very clear targets. From 2040 and onwards, it will be 100% fossil-free solutions from us. That goes for tailpipe emissions, but it also goes for the manufacturing footprint of our vehicles. And we have already started this journey. Already today, we are offering battery electric solutions from all our product areas. Battery electric trucks, battery electric buses, battery electric construction machines and battery-based solutions coming out of Volvo Penta. In the second half of this decade, we will also start delivering solutions based upon fuel cells, then running on green hydrogen. And we also believe that the internal combustion engine has a life in the long run as well, but then running on renewable fuels. Taking a company from a fossil-based to a fossil-free company is a true transformation. It's a paradigm shift. It's even a revolution. And we are convinced that we cannot do this on our own. We are embracing partnerships in order to accelerate innovation. By working together with other companies, Together with agencies, governments and academia, we are convinced that we together can create the world that we want to live in. Let me give you some examples of partnerships and collaborations. On the battery side, we are deeply involved together with Samsung SDI. We have created a joint venture together with Daimler Trucks called Cell Centric, where we are developing and will produce fuel cells. We have a great collaboration with SSAB when it comes to fossil-free steel. And we are in deep conversations with agencies and governments around both production and infrastructure when it comes to green electricity and green hydrogen. One excellent collaboration forum for us is the Energy Transition Commission. And we have now been members for a few years and we are extremely happy with this collaboration. In the Energy Transition Commission, we are meeting other leading companies, leading institutions that have decided to go towards net zero. We are very happy today to have the chairman of the ETC here on board on our panel, Lord Adair Turner. And I can tell you, Adair is a go-to person when it comes to the energy trans transition issues. He is, as a matter of fact, a rock star in this domain. He's one of our prominent guests today in the program. One of them is also, of course, our moderator, Katarina Rolfsdotter Jansson, who will guide us through the program. So once again, a warm welcome. And by that, over to you, Katarina. Well, thank you very much, Lars. Thank you very much indeed. As Lars mentioned, we are happy and honored to have Lord Adair Turner with us here today. A warm welcome to you, and also Robert Andean, who is uh, Director General of the Swedish Energy Agency. Martin Pei, uh, CTO of SSRB, and we have also with us Johan Regnell, who is Head of Strategy at Vattenfall. And Jakob Lundén, Johan, Johan Lundén, I'm sorry, Johan, uh, who is representing the Volvo Group and the, and the Energy Transitions Commission. And uh, we have many important questions to address here today. We're going to talk about, of course, the global energy transition and very much also about the need of collaboration and how this, this need is becoming more and more urgent. 
uh, as we as we speak. Um, uh, there are many questions and also many opportunities that will be addressed today, and we hope to be able to address as many of them as possible. So let's start with you, Lord Turner. Uh, what is actually the Energy Transitions Commission? Well, the Energy Transitions Commission is, is a coalition. It's a coalition which has freely got together. It's about 50 companies now. It's across the world. It's in Europe, it's in the US, it's in China, it's in uh, India, and it's from many sectors. We have oil and gas companies there. We have uh, renewable electricity companies. We have steel companies uh, here in Sweden. I'm pleased to say we have Volvo, uh, we have Vattenfall, uh, we have uh, SSAB. And all of these different companies are united in the belief that we have got to meet the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement, limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade and ideally to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And our task at the ETC, the Energy Transition Commission, is we look at the technologies that can get us to the net zero economy that we need to be at by mid-century, because to meet those climate objectives, we need to get the world economy to net zero by around 2050. We look at all the technologies that are required. We look at the investments required to get there. And we look at the mix of what business can do for itself and where it needs assistance and support from government policy to take us towards that objective. And that is essentially the role that we play looking at all of the different sectors and the interconnections between those different sectors. Very interesting indeed. Uh, talking about technologies, what key technologies need to be in place and are they coming to be in place quickly enough? Well, they're not coming in place quickly enough. We need to speed it up. But let me talk about four key technologies of which I think two are the most important. The single most important is electricity. Electricity, we've had it for 150 years, but we are going to electrify more of the economy uh, over the next 30, uh, 40 uh, years. We will probably take the direct use of electricity from about 20% of final energy demand now to 60% or even more by 2050 as we completely electrify passenger uh, road transport, as we electrify more of residential heating, and indeed as electricity demand uh, increases with information technology. So electricity is absolutely fundamental. And even in rich developed economies, we're going to see electricity go up two and a half, uh, three times maybe. But in places like Africa, we're going to see electricity demand go up 10, 15, 20 times. We see a world in which total global use of electricity could go from 27,000 terawatt hours today to as much as 90 or 100,000 by mid-century. And all of that electricity has got to be zero carbon. So key technologies there, solar, wind, maybe nuclear, uh, those are the absolute core there. In addition, however, there are bits of the economy that we can't directly electrify there. And the single most important technology to get to those is hydrogen. Hydrogen probably primarily made in a green fashion by electrolysis of water, which means we need even more electricity uh, to do that. And we can see total global hydrogen use going from 100 million tons uh, today to 500 or 800 million tons by mid-century. As we use hydrogen in long distance trucking, in shipping in the form of ammonia, or indeed to make steel like this half a kilogram of uh, steel uh, from the Hibrit plant in Lulia, uh, which I just uh, visited uh, yesterday. So hydrogen will be a crucial technology. There are then two other technologies. There are bioenergy and there's carbon capture and storage. I put those as secondary because if you look at the role they play, they're less important mm -hmm. than the absolute two, uh, the, the two most important. Bioenergy has a role to play provided we keep it within sustainable limits. Carbon capture and storage has a role to play. There are some segments where we will really need it like cement, but we mustn't use it as an excuse to say that we can keep using fossil fuels in large quantities mm -hmm. into the 21st century. The core of the strategy has to be to move beyond fossil fuels in a quite dramatic fashion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Lord Turner. In terms of policies, yep. what policies needs to be put in place and what can the, can the governments do to facilitate this green transition in terms of technology investments? Well, it's interesting. If you'd asked in the past a, a theoretical free market economist, mm. they'd have sat down and said, OK, well, there's one policy only. It's, it's carbon pricing, mm. right? We only just had a global benevolent dictator or a global parliament which agreed a global carbon price. We could all go home 
and, and not worry uh, about it. The transition would occur because the market will get there. Even if you had that, would, that would be a bit of a delusion. Uh, but we don't have that. We're not going to have one global carbon price. And it's also there are other instruments we need as well. Carbon prices are very important. We should have carbon prices. But what we also need governments to do is to have the confidence that they know that some technologies are fundamental and to support them by focus support through the initial stages of, of development. Let me give you an example. Back in 2000, the German government was being criticized for the huge subsidies that was given to giving to, say, Bavarian farmers to put solar panels on their uh, roofs uh, at that stage. But without those initial subsidies for solar panels, we would not have unleashed the economies of scale and learning curve effects, which over the last 22 years have reduced the cost of producing solar electricity by about 98%. 98% in just over uh, two decades. And so you need governments to have the confidence to say, these are technologies that we will, uh, we will need. They give support to them, whether it's be hydrogen, hydrogen electrolysis, fuel cells, batteries, uh, uh, wind, solar. And provided they give that early support, after a period of time, and we're now there with solar and wind, they're so low cost that they don't need the subsidies mm -hmm. any longer. So that focused subsidy is a very important strategy alongside carbon pricing as well. Thank you very much. I'd like now to turn to, to Robert from, from the Swedish Energy Agency. In terms of policies and also um, key actions to speed up the transition from your point of view, could you give us a few, few sentences here, please? Well, there's some has been mentioned already mm -hmm. that are, are, of course, crucial to speed up the transition that, and being a core part of the transition as such. Uh, being a public uh, and government agency, I think that we have a, a, a very important role as well to play in supporting and finding ways to, become, uh, to give an added value to what is happening now within industry, for instance. And we also see financial institutions are moving towards sustainability uh, more rapidly than before. Uh, so how can we support that? Mm -hmm. uh, four things. First of all, I think that we need to give uh, uh, clear uh, and easy to get information on how the energy system works, how the transition works, what is going on, what will it uh, have uh, the consequences of it for the ordinary man and woman on the streets, uh, for the local community, uh, for, the, for the national uh, system as such. So information is key. Uh, another thing is the storytelling on the benefits and opportunities of the transition. Ha less pollution, uh, smarter, more just uh, 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 cities and communities, uh, uh, smarter mobility solutions and all of that. We need to tell that story that cl uh, transition is not only about um, uh, combating the climate change, it's also about uh, getting a smarter society. Mm. Uh, thirdly, I think that we as an agency uh, can be a very good matchmaker, finding the public-private partnerships, the public-to-public -public partnerships, the private-to-private -private partnerships to endorse that and find arenas for them to meet the actors that need to meet, the new actors that need to meet. The traditional ones are not enough anymore. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, that includes, of course, civil society and academia. Uh, fourthly, I think that what we also must do as a government agency is to identify the unsustainable structures and systems that are prevailing, so mm. to say, and also po point to new solutions, how to overcome that. Because you can't just build new things and believe that they are, everyone cheer for the new things, but you need to demolish the existing structures, otherwise you will not have that movement and that pace that you need for a transition. Mm. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn back to you, uh, Lord Turner, and, and, and this uh, emphasis on the collaboration, uh, the public-private partnerships, for instance. What would you like to add? Would you like to add anything there? Well, I think there's a really important balance for a governments to get right between relying on the market mm -hmm and indirect levers like a carbon price and then saying these clever people at private industry mm -hmm. will do it. But sometimes we also need a vision from government as well. And the one area where I would really focus on that is in the electricity system, right? 
w unless we have a vision of how big these future electricity systems will be mm -hmm. and the sort of scale of development that there will have to be, whether it in solar or in wind or a, 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 a nuclear or, or, or bioenergy, and I know there's a new bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage mm -hmm. uh, plant being developed in, in Stockholm, unless there's a vision of roughly what the shape might be, and unless there's what's called good power market design, the way that you do auctions, the way that you do fixed price contracts, the private industry will not be able to bring forward the generation fast enough in order to meet the future demands. But also, crucially, the issue of a distribution systems and transmission systems. Uh, we will need to build more electricity transmission, mm. and that's public policy because it, it involves planning, it involves approval, usually for regulated monopolies, usually provide a transmission. So it's an area where you can't just have the government say, oh, well, as long as I set some indirect incentives, mm. you know, hand it over and the private sector will do. And governments need to get this balance right. I think a lot of governments back in the 1990s, as we went through various revolutions, sort of overdid the, 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 the private market Kool-Aid, as it were, you know, they, they sort of believed that markets could do absolutely everything and didn't realize that there is still a crucial role for governments alongside the innovation and the cost reduction which will come out of the private sector. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to, to Yuan Lundi and from, from Volver Group. Um, I hear uh, very often now uh, the Vol Volver Group and also in other parts of the industry talking a bit about the chicken and egg situation when it comes to energy supply and also the infrastructure of, of, su of supply, energy supply, and uh, the corresponding charging and green hydrogen infrastructure. Um, how do we align th these two dif different sectors in, in this transition to so we really com come to speed, up to speed at the same, sa same direction and same speed? Well, I, I would love to have the perfect answer to that question, but I think one very good answer to the question is really the, the, the display we have here today, meaning partnerships. Mm. It's really bringing those partnerships together and, and driving that change, uh, making it happen, because I don't think waiting for it to happen will, will be very difficult then to hit the sweet spot of what that timing should or could be. Uh, then it's, of course, making sure that the technology is there, uh, but that is also part of, of, of the partnership. True partnership is about transparency and sharing a common goal. And if that's clear to all partners uh, involved, I think we will be successful in, in, in driving that change. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of technology in play here that, that needs to sort of be in place. And it's not the sort of a, a serial activity of, of things where, where we plan one and then we go to the next. I think what will, will take us to, to a net zero society will be a multitude of technologies that coexist over the course of time. And here, of course, perfecting what we know and, and, and lowering emissions from, from current products, but also then making sure that we have those truly zero emission solutions going forward will be key to, to making it happen. But I think it's, it's forward leaning. And then I think ultimately it is making sure that our customers are, are at the center of what we do, meaning that as long as that is, is sustainably also financially to do, uh, it, it, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good examples internationally that where this is happening? Well, I think there are plenty of, of opportunities where, where customers are now then taking uh, electrified vehicles, for example, into operations and seeing that they are actually, which is a uh, financially uh, suitable and viable to operate uh, in, in, a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. And that is now, of course, helping drive the change because that will then, of course, put demand on, on electricity, on, on supply of, of charging infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But it is a, it is a momentum and an inertia that we need to get going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lord Turner, you've been visiting Lulio the earlier this morning, and now we have uh, Martin Pei here with us. Uh, Martin, you are putting your bets on, on fossil-free steel, mm. uh, even if it, mi it might not be a rock-solid business case from day one. But how, in your point of view, do we make sure that, that uh, we have a market pull for these new, very important green technologies? Yes, uh, steel is uh, an extremely important material for the modern society. Mm. Uh, and we believe very strongly uh, already in a uh, for a long time ago that we need to find a technology to produce steel without uh, CO2 footprint to supply to our customers. That can enable the future net zero economy. Thinking about producing this huge amount of uh, electricity that uh, Lord Adair Turner just mentioned and the Lars mentioned in the introduction about the whole mobility sector. So without steel, it uh, will not work. Uh, we have been working SSAB since a long time back with uh, improving our 
current production technology, we have come to a point where we don't see any possibilities to drastically reduce CO2 emission if we don't make this breakthrough step. That was uh, the reason why we started the hybrid initiative together with uh, Vattenfall LKB, where we believe that this is uh, the right technology to move forward. And to make this work, we need also uh, collaboration with customers, and we are very happy to have the collaboration with, with Volvo Group. That uh, We now see that our customers are start to believe in this way to make steel and start to ask for more such products. So that gives us the confidence. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And you decided to um, accelerate really the transition. I mean, most part of the market were probably stunned when you really put this out. And you, we talked earlier today about the, the, the how, how far ahead this, this, um, this production really is. Um, the, the, the how you were very brave in doing this. And um, how important was collaboration to take that initial step? Yes, it, uh, it was uh, when we launched the hybrid initiative, mm. uh, a lot of uh, people in our industry uh, were not uh, really convinced this mm. uh, was the right way to go. And luckily, we in Sweden are very good at collaboration. Uh, we've been collaborating uh, since the past, uh, making big steps in technology development. And we have also good uh, uh, government supporting us uh, initially with the uh, research fund to make this uh, happen. And in our case, we uh, three companies, mining company, energy company, and steel company joined forces. We uh, collaborated to make this huge uh, uh, research program. So that has been uh, extremely important. Without collaboration, if you think about a uh, uh, very important value chain from mining to energy to steel production, only one company itself cannot mm. make the technology shift. We need collaborations. Now we have collaboration with uh, customers like Volvo Group that makes the whole case much stronger. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lorda Turner, coming from Lulio this morning, uh, what are your key sort of findings uh, in terms of learnings also putting into other industries and other processes for what you've experienced in Lulio and hybrid? Well, what I saw yesterday in Lulia, I mm -hmm. hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, was incredibly impressive. Mm -hmm. An entire new way of making steel, a much cleaner, much simpler way, uh, with hydrogen, completely, uh, potentially zero CO2 emissions. And you just have to go to Lulia and look at the old blast furnace technique and its complexity and its uh, the emissions and the complicated stages to realize uh, that this is uh, the future. Uh, and indeed, I think what's really interesting is that a lot of people have been very slow to realize this. Uh, the, the UK government uh, has been, until recently, suggesting that we should open a new coking coal mine. Oh dear. And I sent them a letter to the relevant officials saying, I don't think this is a very good idea because the future of steel is not coking coal. And I got a letter back from officials saying, well, it may be possible that at some stage in the future there are new technologies mm. to make steel, but at the moment the only way is uh, coking coal. And I'm now going to tell them it's about time you went to Lulia mm. uh, because you will learn or have a look at this that there are completely new ways of doing it. And I think what, what I saw at Lulia is, first of all, this very important collaboration between three uh, companies, LKAB, who produce the iron ore, and, and the pellets, who do some of the pr processing themselves in a way which is different from iron ore companies, uh, many other iron ore companies across the world. Uh, Vattenfall, who are the key provider of the electricity, but also the storage. Hydrogen storage is going to be uh, crucially important. It's a way to store uh, energy. And then the, uh, the, the hybrid, the steel production plant itself, which SSAB is directly in charge of. So I think what you're seeing there is both collaboration and vision. The willingness to invest into a technology which five years ago people did not think was going to be the new technology. People thought that we would take those existing complicated blast furnaces and make them even more complicated by adding on a CCUS plant. And the revolution of expectations which occurred over the last five years in relation to what the future of steel is, I think is an incredibly positive move. Because realize, if you look at all the emissions in the energy buildings, industry, and transport sector, steel across the world is seven or eight percent of those. So getting an answer to how we produce zero carbon steel is a really important step forward for the world. Indeed it is. 
Andrea Signel, uh, Vattenfall is a crucial player in this transition. Uh, when you hear uh, the reflections here from Lord Adair Turner, what, 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 are, what, are your, what are your comments? I'd like to, to actually pick up on Lord Adair's uh, discussion on, on, on the need for a plan, because I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion. Will there be enough electricity? Will the permits come in time? And, 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 and I think if we step back a bit, I think there will be different things that are the current scarcity or, 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 or uh, roadblocks mm -hmm. for progress. And I think uh, five years ago, it was actually the awareness that it was needed that was the roadblock. The, the world didn't understand it really. And I think here ETC uh, made an enormous uh, push and making the world understand that it is needed and it's possible. And I think we passed that point. And I think many corporations, many agencies, governments, and you name it, they actually understand it's needed we have to do it, and it's actually possible. So the current, I mean, restrictions, at least for us now, we want to do fossil-free steels as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. it's the permits mm -hmm. to actually get the power lines in place. And, and I think uh, once, but I think once we get through the permits, and that's literally for this project, but generally speaking, the, accept, the, accept the societal acceptance of what we do. And that's where this the societal plan is so important because we need to have a democratic process where we agree that this isn't necessary. It does mean that we need a lot of power lines, mm -hmm. a lot of windmills, and how are we share the benefits and the burdens of, of that. Uh, but then, and once we get through that point, I think we'll run into a supply chain issue. Mm -hmm. But that's a few years, uh, and I think, Lord, that you mentioned yesterday that in Luleå, they mentioned that they need 100,000 more people in, in the northern Sweden to fix all these projects. Mm -hmm. And once these 100,000 people move there, mm -hmm. there will be a lack of a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, th there's already thi uh, constantly new boundaries for what sets the pace. Mm -hmm. And I think now it's, uh, it happens to be, in the Swedish context, it's the permissions. Mm -hmm. Once that's sold, we'll get into supply chain issue. And and it's not that we're not going to solve them, but we just need to be aware that there will be new things we need to mm -hmm. to uh, kind of manage. Mm -hmm. and but of course it's exciting, and it's um, mm -hmm. yeah, and more exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, now I need to turn to Robert. Of course, uh, this is your field: uh, plans and policies and and whatnot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I think that first of all, I would like to say that there's a lot of talk around the world to how do you address the hard to abate mm -hmm. uh, sector scenarios shipping, mining, uh, steel production, and, and s what have you. Uh, the thing is that what we are doing in Sweden now, we are walking the talk. That's my, that's my uh, conviction. And um, what we see now is that we have an acceptance issue among the general public. If we want to have more windmills, we need to have acceptance that they are built on land or uh, offshore. And what we see now is that the transition is, is actually moving um, not quick enough or fast enough, but still quite fast. And the general public is not actually following and understanding. And that's what I meant with what I'm saying, information. Uh, and also um, having objective uh, information on, uh, for instance, prices. What we see today with the w Russian war on Ukraine is that the energy prices are increasing enormously. And also Sweden has uh, uh, kind of uh, a rippled effect on a, a mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And what we see now is quick actions from politicians that are not necessarily going hand in hand with the long term vision that we have or what industry is doing at the moment. Uh, and I think that pan th the pandemic situation we had, industry and the financial market uh, kind of woke up and understood the, 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 the benefits and the necessity of moving towards a green transition. I hope that the horrible things that is going on in Europe now uh, is a wake-up call for the governments to realize that we need to move away from the fossil economy. Mm. And lastly, on, on the thing that having a, a more of a public plan, I think that it's what we need to discuss, but it's difficult in a deregulated market. Mm. Who will have that plan? Who will nurture it? Mm. Who will kind of follow up on it? Uh, and we need to decide that. But otherwise, I agree very much with Andrea's uh, view on what we need to do in Sweden. Mm. Thank you. You mentioned communications. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but last this last year, 68% of the permits f to, uh, to put, a, put, a, put out uh, wind, power, uh, wind power plants in Sweden were declined. Uh, because most of, region, most of the regions did not want them in their backyard. 
So how do we how do we connect the dots dots between a fossil free of steel in a Volvo car uh, with the with uh, with the uh, hybrid process and uh, the acceptance of actually having a wind power plant in your in your in your region? Uh, there is talk about uh, the regions getting kickbacks, uh, some benefits of having that uh, the, the plant uh, established in their in their their backyard. What are your reflections on this, Robert? I think that again, storytelling. Mm. And I think that we have to have courageous decision makers on the political level, nationally and locally, mm. to explain how things are relate, the cause and effect of things. As I said, the energy prices. If we have a problem with high electricity prices at the moment, we need to realize that we need to build more production. And we need to build production close to the consumption. But that is a very that, that's a challenge at the moment, because the political level, I would say, um, do not actually walk the talk mm. as much as they should. It's not only the political system, of course. It's a lot of other actors that need to be spokesperson of the, of the transition, the need for it, and the benefits on the social and economic perspective, and not only a climate combating perspective. Mm. Thank you. Would you like to add? I think this issue of wider public understanding mm. of what's required and bridging between different groups in this debate is important. So there's a very important bit of what has occurred over the last five years has been the pressure from youth and from environmentalist com uh, campaigners. And of course, the great icon of that mm. is here in Sweden. It, it, it is Greta Thunberg, who I think has done a fantastic job. And so it's very good that we now have, that has placed pressure on politicians to say, yes, we're going to get to net zero. What we need now is a clearer understanding of what getting to net zero will require. And crucially, mm -hmm. It's electricity, it is electrification. And we actually need politicians to stand up and say, can everybody realize we, even Sweden, already a rich developed country, even Britain, is going to consume by 2050 twice as much electricity. And that electrification will give all sorts of benefits. As long as it's clean, it will give us a, a limitation to global warming. It will create our cities much more pleasant places uh, to live. It will make us more energy secure uh, for countries, much of Europe, of course, we've now realized terribly reliant on uh, Russian uh, oil and gas. It has huge huge benefits, but it has consequences. We've got to create a real sense of agreed national and international commitment that we're going to do that. And that means that some environmentalists who might in the past have said, I want you to fix climate change, but I don't want this windmill in my backyard, mm -hmm. have got to face the reality that that is going to be the only way in which we fix this problem of climate change. Thank you. And Andreas, in Vattenfall, you have a campaign fossil free within uh, a generation and wonderful images. Uh, how important is communication for Vattenfall in this transition? Oh, uh, communication is, uh, I think we more or less, maybe the missing point, actually, mm. piece in, in the transition in a total sense, because I think we, we're so convinced that the the climate uh, path that we think we need to be, everyone understands it, mm. and that the implications of it. So uh, I would say this is, we've come a long way in the technology development, we've come a long way in convincing boards and, and, and the politicians, but we haven't done the job in convincing and explaining, and it's not, it's not only one way, because if we say we just need to explain and they will understand mm. and we'll all be fine. That's that information, that not communication. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a dialogue that is required, that, that we, we come to a point where we agree, because I think just, I so, so communication is more uh, indicates a one way, but I think it's, so if I would say uh, dialogue is where we kind of underinvested grossly, and it's, it's Sweden, it's, it's everyone that wants to do the climate transition, We've underinvested in dialogue because that's what's required to get the uh, true conviction and understanding and engagement in doing it. Because as long as we are kind of going uphill uh, with headwind, uh, that will th th when we will be finished by 2150, mm -hmm. and we need to we don't we can't wait until that. Though. No, we cannot wait until then. Yuan, uh, would you like to add anything from from the Volvo Group perspective in terms of what we just talked about here, um, yeah. storytelling, collaboration? Uh, I'm sorry, c communication. Yes, I think. I mean, uh, th the communication goes through the whole value chain, meaning that our customers also, of course, need to understand how this impacts their their business, what choices they can or should make, mm -hmm. 
early to make the adoption and make it happen. Uh, looking from our perspective, making sure that they go from a fossil-based uh, solution to a, a, a zero emission solution, of course has its hesitations. How will it function in my daily life? Because it's a business. It has, to, it has to generate income and it has to deliver goods to, and people to, to places they need to go. So I think here we have a lot of communication and training to do as well, and then supporting them in making that choice. Because already today, as mentioned, technology is there for many of them. It is possible to deploy, but I do think that some will hesitate on the back of not really knowing what it will imply. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Accessibility, we touched upon this subject already. Uh, accessibility from all types of perspectives on clean energy. Um, what are the most crucial steps need that, that's needed to be taken to make sure that there is accessibility? Uh, let's, let's focus on the grid. Well, what's going to happen with the grid, and, and you have to think of both what's called transmission, which mm -hmm. is the, the long uh, distance, uh, higher voltage lines, and then the distribution that gets all the way down to the individual home uh, uh, and, and business. Uh, both of these are going to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have transmission grids, which will have to get bigger, but they'll also be, have to be built in different places. They haven't been built in order to connect where the wind is uh, with where the centers of demand are. So that we are going to have to have new building in new places. In the UK, for instance, our national grid wants to actually build an undersea grid all the way across the a, uh, the North Sea, so that when you build a new wind farm, you'll be able to plug into that rather than every wind farm having to make its own connection into uh, the mainland of Britain. And that's the sort of vision you need uh, in that, uh, the, the long distance transmission. On the shorter distance transmission, what of course we're going to end up with is much more power needed in particular locations. So Volvo has a, a joint venture, I think it's with a, a Daimler, to develop high-speed chargers, chargers which can, can, you know, in half an hour, uh, power up a, a really big electric truck, at, you know, um, auto route motorway service stations all the way across Europe. That will require a much bigger connecting bit of electricity going to that station than has ever been before. If you take a system like London, where everybody is heating their homes with gas, mm. and say, no, we want you to heat them with a heat pump, mm. you are suddenly going to have to do stuff in the street to dig it up and get a bigger wire uh, through to that end home. So this is one area where you do really need a plan and a, 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 a how it all fits together point of view, because otherwise you'll end up, you know, Volvo will end up developing developing some electric trucks in some of the segments, and somebody will say, well, we now want charging points in this location, but the, the distribution provider is going to say, well, nobody told us that sufficiently far in advance, and it's going to take us X years before we can do that. So it is in this particular area of grid of how we make sure that all of us will be able to get access not only to electricity, but to the amount of electricity that we want. If you go, we're going to be doing a big piece of work at the ETC this year on, in Africa. Now, in Africa, the issue is, how do you get electricity to people for the first time? Mm. In Europe, everybody has access to electricity. It's just that, in many cases, it's going to have to have access to much more electricity, which means the wires getting to their home or business are going to have to be much bigger than they were before. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we make sure that this really, we don't get these bumps in the road? Uh, the collaboration in different authorities and also countries, because now the North Sea will be quite soon quite crowded uh, from windmills and we need to be able to facilitate the transmission of, yeah. of what we're taking down from the harvesting from the wind. Uh, you're obviously, your organization is a key player here. Yeah. What other players? You have the companies here represented? Well, the, com the company collaboration is, mm. is, is very, very important. And we talked earlier about you know, making green steel mm. uh, and the, the three-way collaboration that that's involved. But it has also involved Volvo saying, we want to buy mm. green steel, which then creates the confidence of the demand that enables the others to go ahead with the investment. So across all of what we call value chains in, in, in business, there are... There is a, a role for companies and suppliers and customers to be getting together to making sure that they are acting in a coordinating fashion. And that's true in all areas of business. I mean, there's a very big and complex issue as to how we take the carbon uh, CO2 out of plastics production. And when you get to that, you really have to have retailers and consumer goods companies talking to each other about redesigning packaging to make it easier 
to recycle, and one of them alone can't do it. So sometimes it's, a, it's value chains getting together, but on this issue of grids in particular, and I return to the fact that when you get to transmission grids and distribution grids, you're actually not dealing with competitive markets. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much always dealing with regulated monopolies, and the regulator is setting the rules of how much and how far in advance those regulated monopolies are allowed uh, to invest. And that's where you absolutely desperately need a clear plan that enables them to invest ahead of demand rather than us getting to the point where the demand is there and saying, well, could you please invest tomorrow? Because mm. they can't invest tomorrow. It, mm. takes, it takes some time to do that. Mm -hmm. I see Martin and Andreas nodding fiercely here. Before I turn to Robert, would you like to reflect, Martin, on this, on the transmission and the supply um, aspects? Yes, this is a really very key uh, aspect for our trans, uh, transformation. Mm. We have now, uh, after five years, uh, very, very uh, advanced research work. We have shown that the technology works using the hybrid uh, uh, process, making steel without CO2 emission. From mine, to steel products. Now we are ready to make this uh, transition to phase out our current platform based production system. We start in auxiliary zones, the first plant 2026 that are aim, where we are in the middle of the permit process to mm. build this power transmission line to connect our say future electric furnace based mill with the grid. We are planning to do the same much earlier, 15 years earlier than earlier communicated in Luleå and also in Roa in Finland. In all these sites, we are urgently in need of getting the power line connection in time because we want to stop pr using current technology, phase out 10% of Sweden's CO2 emission by doing that step. It's a huge uh, step for the climate, but also to deliver steel without CO2 emission to our customers like Volvo and others who are waiting for these products. Mm -hmm. And here we really need to get the process going, the permit process, acceptance in the society. And here I believe that our political system really need to follow the business community's higher ambition and to support that process. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see that currently now. That's uh, one of the big risks mm -hmm. uh, for our transformation. You're ahead of the game. Yeah, we feel that we are right now in the process that this uh, permit process is actually setting the pace mm. when we can stop importing coal for steel production. Mm -hmm. Andreas, do you agree? Yeah, I think I would face nodding uh, this. I mean, it's uh, obvious that we need a plan, but but of course, I think then many say, well, well, as as Lola there said, well, the market should do it, uh, or there are arguments for that the market should do it, mm. and and I think n it has the market has never done a transition before, so it won't do it this time either. And I think the other thing is, yes, uh, one uh, other counter argument that you might be it's difficult to plan because there's so much uncertainty, so the plan might be wrong, but I think that that mistake is much smaller mm. than to not act so so I, I that was probably what why i was kind of feeling that i needed to say something that mm. yes the plan might be not 100 percent right but we still need the plan and also if you have a plan it could be revised right absolutely if you have no plan there's something agile. To revise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. agile planning mm. <laughs> robot yeah no there's so many dimensions of the clean energy transition i have to say that we're focusing on uh, one factor now, the grids, and then you have sub-factors like mm. the permit and, and how fast you, and the business models and, and modernization and stuff like that. Uh, but we have to realize that what we also see is a, a very quick technology uh, 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 evolution. So if you invest in the grids, I mean, b b you can have the offshore windmills now in different places, mm -hmm. much further out and stuff like oh that. Yes. And when you invest in these huge uh, infrastructures like the grid, um, you have to take that into account. But I, I, I also like to say that regulatory sandboxes, I think that that is the way to go, that you have flexibility within the frame. You enlarge on the frame and you can work between the actors, uh, the governments and, and the, the industry. So we need to, to be courageous enough to test that much more than we've done in various areas. And I'd just li like to add in that we have other factors that are quite important. Standardization, both nationally and, and on the EU level and globally. And you also have the question of digitalization. 
artificial intelligence linking into the electrification, meaning open data, cybersecurity, information security. And all of these we have to be able to deal with in parallel with dealing with upgrading the grid, dealing with new building new production and so forth. So I just to realize it's, it's a whole system we need to change. It's whole value change we need to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that that is uh, challenging. It's also something that gets me going in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have to be uh, quite also humble before uh, in front of that and, and prioritize mm -hmm. what is the key things to move first. Mm -hmm. Before I turn to you, Juan, because uh, you, you, you wanted to come in. Uh, when I, I've worked with sustainability and energy for quite a few years now, and my, my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the politicians, some of them, many of them, just do not have enough knowledge about what is needed to be done. And uh, is, is there a need to educate our politicians? And how, how can we get about, this is a sort of a sensitive <laughs> question, but in the broader base, I'm not pointing out a speci specific party, but the knowledge uh, of, of, of what, is, what is really needed uh, to be, be put in place. Um, uh, do they have enough knowledge? Or if they don't, how do we, how do we make sure they do? Robert? Yes, sorry to take the word again. That's fine. <laughs> We had an energy agreement 2016. Mm -hmm. That's six years ago. We had very knowledgeable energy politicians at that stage. That has been a couple of years going together, working, and, and actually being well informed about the challenges and what to do. Polit the political aspects came into play anyway just a couple of years afterwards. There are different dynamics in the political mm. world than perhaps in, in what we are dealing with. Unfortunately, mm. sometimes I it becomes, it gets wrong. Yeah, it it over overrides the, the incentive of... of so of it's not only about education, mm. it's also actually about uh, mm. the political larger picture in a way sometimes. The political game. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, I was thinking, uh, speaking of education, I think, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, why the Volvo Group is very happy to be part of the ETC, because it is a part of educating ourselves as well, getting involved in this, in this bigger system. I, I, I can't help but reflect over one instance we had in a commissioner's meeting when one of our commissioners was saying that you kind of have to have the, the hat of CEO of the planet, kind of, when you're listening mm. into that and seeing how this dynamic is in play and, and playing off of what Andreas was saying earlier. We... We push the boundaries and we learn every time we do that. And I think that's the, the key message here really is to, to make sure that we are pushing those boundaries constantly. And, and, and what uh, Lord Adair was, was referring to, the, we have a joint venture together with Daimler and the Trayton Group on, on charging in, in Europe. And that, quite frankly, let's say five, ten years ago, would completely unthinkable to have a, a partnership with our fiercest competitors. But now then making this transition, it's, it's, it's if you so well, obvious that we need that to put the momentum on. And then we'll learn as we go. We'll probably figure out that a lot of the spots where we would like to put the charging station, I the grid will not be acceptance of it. OK, how do we get there then? Uh, then we need to figure that out as we go. And it'll be a, a constant, if I say so, battle, but I think also a very exciting journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juan. Lord Adair Turner. Well, R Robert mentioned, you know, developing an expertise and then maybe losing momentum because of this sort of, you know, scrappy thing called democracy. Ah. Um, and uh, I think it was Winston Churchill said, you know, that democracy was the worst possible system apart from any other system that you could think of. Mm. Uh, you know, I think we should be very proud of our democratic uh, systems and values, but we need to find ways to have that long-term vision through the political cycle. And the UK, you know, lots of things the UK gets wrong uh, a, in all sorts of areas of our policy. But one area we have got right is we've created a particular institutional structure on climate, which came out of our Climate Change Act in 2006. And we set up a thing called the Climate Change Committee, and I was the first chair uh, of it. And that committee is responsible for developing the overall point of view of what is the shape of how we get to net zero. And indeed, what it does is it also sets what are called carbon budgets, and it sets these in five-year periods, and at any one time, there are three of these set in advance. And this framework, which w w achieved you know, complete cross-party support when it was set up, mm. then creates an environment for having a continuity and a long-term approach to policy which can survive uh, changes uh, in government. Uh, it, it's similar to the challenge that you have to get in you know, anti-inflation policy where we've given to 
central banks like the Riksbank an authority to pursue an inflation target which gives some independence from short-term political cycles. You also need to do it whenever you're trying to develop pension policy. And mm -hmm. in fact, when I was the chair of the UK's pension uh, a commission back in 2003, I actually came to Sweden as a model of a country which had managed more than others to develop a long-term vision and a cross-party vision of how some crucial aspects of the pension system will develop. So we do have these particular problems. Pensions is one and a climate is another, where to solve them, we need some continuity of policy through the political cycle. And I think thinking about what are the institutional structures that do that uh, is also something that we should think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I say that the collaboration that's now happening between SSRB, uh, EKB, Vattenfall, and also uh, Volvo Group as a customer, um, that this can actually facilitate a deeper understanding of the processes that needs to be in place. What do you say then, Martin? Yes, this is extremely important. Uh, we make a, a fantastic steel product, mm. but if uh, our customers don't appreciate that, we really don't have any value of it. Mm. Now, with the collaboration with uh, Volvo, we, we now can uh, tell a fantastic story, because in the future you can envision a completely fossil-free value chain, mm. from taking out iron ore from mining, to make steel using the electricity we get, and then Volvo makes this truck that can transport food to every hole. Mm -hmm. The whole value chain without any CO2 mm -hmm. footprint. That is uh, really the future we should live for our next generation. And this is really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Andreas, uh, in terms of going, going back to the policymakers and the politicians, when you listen to Lord Adair Turner here, the, the what's happening in the UK, and also in, in the light of the collaboration that you're, that you're participating in. How, how, would that, how important would this be for Vattenfall that to have more of a longer, uh, more stable uh, uh, conditions for, for, for your work? I think it would be very positive for Vattenfall, but I think it's even more positive for, for Sweden and, and, and the world, actually, because I think, to be honest, we will do reasonably fine anyway, because the market is going pretty bananas already mm -hmm. as it is. So, so I think we will be, but, but of course, it's much better if we direct our resources and we can work with others in a stable environment where there's a clear plan and a clear, clear target so that we take the shortest route. Uh, so I, I think it's very important to reach that uh, kind of longer term perspective in both in terms of policies and the plan, but it's more for the sake of Sweden and the competitiveness and, and the world, if you want, rather than maybe individual companies. Mm. Thank you. Johan, would you like to add before we conclude? No, I was, I, I was thinking, as you, as you mentioned it, that longer plan, and, and uh, I've reflected uh, quite often in, in recent days over how, how we're used to this very incremental, which is a relative improvement uh, mm. year after year. We, we get 3% better uh, than last year, and we're 2% better than our competitor, etc. Now, th th the target is fairly clear in terms of everyone needs to go to zero. So now that that's changing sort of the, the, the dynamics of the mm -hmm. game a little bit, which is which is truly interesting. And then we are dependent on, on, on partnerships like this. We, we uh, a truck is on average roughly 50, 60 percent steel. So unless we have fossil free steel and we have the goal of, of going completely uh, fossil free, we're reliant on, on partners like SSAB. Mm -hmm. So I think that that common, which is a very long term goal by all means, but but very important one, one really is is, is unifying. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, all of you for sharing your important insights and uh, let's just keep up the, the good speed and the wonderful collaboration. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So Lars, your main takeaways from this listening to the panel here? Well, I have summarized it um, in two areas. The first one is really regarding electricity. Green electricity and green hydrogen, about the uh, generation and the distribution. And I really liked these um, discussions around the storytelling. We all have the responsibility to be the storyteller. Everyone in society needs to understand that we are talking about at least doubling the use of electricity or tripling or even more in different countries. And this is something that we need as a vision in society to understand the scale and the magnitude of this transformation. Mm. 
Second area is partnerships. I think we have heard a lot about partnerships today and both public partnerships together public-private as uh, Robert has been into, but also then between different companies. And I must say that the hybrid project with uh, LKAB, Vattenfall and SSAB is a fantastic project and then also with public funding from the Swedish government and the agencies. And now then with Volvo on board as the first customer we are closing then this value chain. So these are the two takeaways from my side, Katarina. Mm -hmm. Well, also, what is the next step for Volvo Group in this aspect of, of energy transition and also um, other companies? What call to action do you have to other companies to make this transition to a fossil-free world? Well, for us in the Volvo Group, it is very much about now executing on our very ambitious plans, be it on tailpipe emissions going to zero, uh, uh, zero emissions, but also then on the manufacturing footprint together with everyone in the value chain, starting in the mines until we produce the vehicles. Uh, looking at other companies, uh, I know that all companies are already in discussions regarding these issues. Uh, I would like to uh, really pinpoint how important it has been for us to build knowledge in this area really to base it up on facts and data. And for us, uh, Energy Transition Commission has been instrumental in this, let's say the teaching part of understanding where we need to go. And then formulate your targets based upon those kind of facts. And then understand with whom you need to team up with because no one can do this on their own, Katarina. That is for sure. Well, thank you very much, Lars. And thank you very much, all of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.